going to be talking today about a book that was recently published. Uh, we wanted to share uh, the, the book with you. Um, the, the book uh, is uh, co-authored, co-edited. We couldn't, we couldn't decide between the publisher and ourselves whether we should call it an edited volume or a co-authored volume. It became very complicated. And so it, it ends up with uh, uh, four editors, but in fact, the book is a co-written book. The editors are myself and Shell, uh, Teresa Shanahan from York University, and Claude Trottier uh, from Laval University. Rob has already identified himself as one of the co-authors. Uh, on the uh, Quebec chapter, Jean de Banaché was also a, a co-author. On the um, Ontario chapter, the other the co-author there uh, uh, was Glenn Jones. And then finally on the BC chapter, in addition to ourselves and, and uh, uh, Rob, uh, the other authors are J.C. Lee, uh, Madeline McIver, and John Meredith. So we're going to uh, divide our talk into four, four parts, and we'll move backwards and forwards, uh, Shell and I. Uh, the first part, uh, we're going to talk about uh, the, the study itself, a general introduction, uh, the purpose of the study. Uh, the second part, we'll focus on the methodology and uh, some of the theoretical frame that we use. In the third part, we'll focus on the findings, which will include a, so a short section on the policy-making process, uh, and then the, the main findings from the study, and then a final section, the conclusion. <clears throat> so I'm going to start with the, the purpose of the study and a description of it. This is a Ford-funded project. Uh, the, the comparison was between uh, Mexico, the United States, and Canada. The Canadian team, in fact, includes all of the people that I've, I've mentioned, but other, other colleagues, and Amy uh, attended part of our uh, deliberations, and other graduate students did as well. The Canadian team was perhaps the largest one of the three. The intent was to do a comparison between these three countries, uh, these three higher education systems, systems, looking specifically at how policy environments uh, determine, uh, or at least are connected to, uh, uh, higher education policies, and then the implementation of those policies, the outcomes. <clears throat> very specific intent, very much a focus on PSE uh, systems. So the Canadian component, uh, we uh, put together a team uh, the, the administration was housed here. The team included, as I've noted, uh, colleagues from Ontario and from Quebec. And what we embarked upon was a, uh, a comparative nested case study of these three uh, provinces. The, the constitutional division of power in, in, in our country uh, meant for us, and we certainly made this argument, that in a sense Canada is uh, almost a, a laboratory-like situation if we want to understand the development of higher education policy, the development of PSE systems. As you know, uh, education is a provincial responsibility, and for all intents and purposes, we have 10 different systems of higher education across the country. Of course, tons of similarities, but also significant differences. We felt the choice of the three provinces, although it depended very much on colleagues we knew and we'd worked with before, it, it was also uh, strategic in the sense that uh, the, the uh, of course Quebec and Ontario represent a large, a large uh, mass of the population, uh, over 70% of the population, and then British Columbia had to be included, of course, because we, we were here. We weren't in Alberta. Uh, <clears throat> we tried as much as possible to make the case study chapters, and there were, as you would expect, three case study chapters in the book, we tried to make them as commensurate and as compatible as possible, both in the way they're written and the way they laid out, so that the reader can, in fact, make the comparisons as they go through uh, the, the work. So, three systems of, of uh, post-secondary education, BC, Ontario, and Quebec. We're looking at the period from 1980 to 2010. I have to tell you, this study went on for so long that initially we were going to finish in 2005. So any doctoral students here who are feeling 
things are taking too long, don't worry. Sometimes they do take a long time, uh, uh, but usually they, they are finished and completed. Um, and to repeat then, the main purpose of the study was to focus on policy environments, to document, document those environments through time, document the policies that were developed through time, uh, and indeed then connect those policies to the outcomes. And of course, uh, focus on the, the, those times when indeed there seems to be a, a direct and clear connection between the policy and the outcome, other times when there's not, when there's a contradiction. Uh, and and as, you, as you know, in our work, there's always tons of contradiction. We adopted a policy sociology uh, approach. Um, in a general sense, we, we saw our study as a sociology of higher education. For those of you that know this literature on policy sociology, uh, it focuses very much on the structural context, um, the social forces that lie behind the creation of policies, in every way trying to uh, locate those policies in the structural context through time with a particular emphasis, as you may expect, on political economy. As we, as we focused on the creation of uh, the policy environment and, of course, as I said, the policy itself and the outcomes, we're also very interested in focusing on, on how the relationship between the state, uh, the restructuring of the state and these policies, how those, those relations work through time. Again, looking at, at the obvious connections, but also uh, looking at some of the contradictions. We uh, began our work uh, with uh, what we described as sensitizing concepts. It's uh, a term that's used in sociology. Uh, it comes really out of, out of the symbolic interactionist tradition, but I think it's an enormously useful way of thinking about uh, doing, doing this sort of research. That is, one begins with a frame of uh, uh, sensitizing theoretical concepts without positing those as being uh, uh, in place or necessarily uh, being the, the only ones that are relevant. And then as one does the study, there's interaction, of course, between what you're finding and the, theor the theory that's emerging uh, in your findings and the frame that you bring. Uh, and and it's that, that is was certainly our intent. We, we uh, hypothesized that state PSC policy uh, is located in these three uh, major overlapping structural trends. Globalization, and we, we relied to some extent on the work of Rizvi and Lingard, their 2010 volume, uh, we found very useful. Marketization, I, I think it's still the case that uh, Simon Marginson's work, um, uh, his whole, is massive, <laughs> the tomes of work that Simon's produced, but uh, very useful. It goes back to 1997, and he continues to produce really fine work on marketization. And then academic capitalism, the, the uh, key text, Slaughter and Rhodes, uh, that they published in 2004. We were <clears throat> attracted to do the work because uh, we, in a sense, took for granted, although still wanted to bracket this, but took for granted that neoliberalism as an ideology would be important in our study. It's uh, almost a taken for granted assumption that over the last 20, uh, perhaps even 30 years, but certainly uh, over, over the last few decades, that neoliberalism as an ideology has had an enormous impact on, on state policies and, and we would suggest on higher education policies, not just in Canada but throughout the world. The, the promotion of public choice, uh, marketization and privatization uh, are all part of what we regard as the neoliberal ideology. <clears throat> An ideology that fosters links between industry, both training and the production of knowledge and, and, uh, and universities and higher education. This, this leads, we would argue, uh, as, as is stated very, very much in the literature, there's a reluctance to spend public funds on, on public projects, a withdrawal <coughs> from that public interest focus. And there's a tendency to push public institutions into competition with each other, uh, to become, uh, uh, as Simon would put it, quasi-markets. Uh, 
In our study then, as we compared uh, the, the, uh, the policies in these three provinces, we, we came up with what we found to be dominant policy themes. And, and in some sense, I think it, it is reasonable to say that they're in order of priority. Accessibility, accountability, marketization, labor force development, and research and development. So the chapters, uh, in, in, in the thing locks that way, in some ways, the three case study chapters go through these five policy themes, how they emerge and how they uh, were present in each of the three provinces over the 30-year period. And then uh, chapter five uh, does a comparison between the three provinces, again, using these, um, these themes as the key. Now, what I've done is cover the first two parts of our talk. What I'm going to do now is hand over to Shell to focus on the third part, which is on the findings. Uh, but he's going to begin by talking about the policy-making process. Yeah, we, we start with the policy making process. I mean, we, we have talked in, in the book or in the case studies, looked at some detail. And, and one of the, the parts that we actually had was some interviews too in each province. But the interviews do not come out in the book very much in the case study chapters. And we could say maybe unfortunately. But, but, but if you look at the policy making process, I mean, here are three common processes that one can describe the, the house t consultation, legislation, systematic orientation. And the one characteristic that stands out is the difference between, on the one hand, Quebec, and the other hand, uh, uh, BC and Ontario. It is really in Quebec that we can find a, a very, very distinct consultative process all through the period. Uh, and it's worth to reflect a little bit why that is the case. What does it make up? And, and one of the things we argue is that, uh, I mean, one is the historical tradition, one with, of course, nation building, the broader context. But another thing is that in, in Quebec, we find very strong unions and very strong uh, the, 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 the organiz professional organization and with the, the, the faculty. And what, what this actually links up in the literature broadly, if you look at, at kind of policy making, is the notion that in order for having kind of con strong consultative uh, uh, processes, one needs to have bodies that are all very strong. I mean, we, we can find that in the corporatist uh, tradition of, of, of uh, policy making. And Quebec is the the, the, the uh, province in Canada that most link up with this. So we use that partly to talk about the consultative. In the other two, uh, we can find, for example, that during the, if you link it to, to political ideology and the, for each of our tables, we have tried to define the party in power. And we have looked a little bit and we described the, the general political economy of the time and other forces. If you look for what happens in BC, it's interesting to note during the NDP era that we also had to move towards the consultative. But it's a consultative that has a much stronger ideological tone to it than we find, for example, in Quebec, where it's more uh, professional, uh, pragmatic. Uh, and what we find if we, we look at, for example, uh, the, the, the second part is we look at the liberal government when they come in here under more neoliberal, or in the Harris government, it's a total rupture of the consultative process. And it comes in much more to a, a conflicting way of doing it. But here is the first part where we can observe, and I will take this with us where we continue to discuss how the structure of some of these bodies in the state actually come to have an impact uh, on what, what takes place on, on, on some of these processes. So that, 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 that's the kind of the, just a little bit about the policy making process. Accessibility is one of the themes, and if you were to talk about, uh, maybe I should have not shown this so quickly and said something, I guess we taken by the, this fantastic data here. But um, that's the other thing, I mean, a warning. If you're going to, in this kind of comparative work, 
it is, uh, how can we say it? You, you, you do a disservice to have data. I mean, data, we always kill ourselves with the data. Uh, you know, you, it has to be comparable, and they change it's the way that Canada that it is assembled in different countries. And the other thing is that data gets outdated very quickly. So, you know, if you have a right to something about more in principles or other things, uh, it, it kind of lasts longer, I think. Now we already feel that since the book was printed, we are outdated. Uh, but accessibility is by far the most clearly important priority. And we can find that through the whole time in each of the provinces. Uh, very, very clearly articul articulated. In, in some ways, regardless of which uh, kind of government that is in power, where the difference comes is that how to implement accessibility and how to link the policy intention to the kind of policy mechanism and the policy outcome that we look at. So for example, and, and here is where we get a little bit of a kind of an uh, almost experimental situation in Canada. What happens in the 90s is that, that there is a, the federal government retract, uh, cuts down the uh, money that goes to the provinces uh, to a considerable extent. So each province is faced with a problem, A, in a general downturn in the economy, and B, with a sharply cut <coughs> transfer money. So what happens here, if we look at this, this is about the 90, in, in the period here, 95, up to about, no, sorry, 95 up to about 90, 98, we've seen a sharp reduction. If you look, for example, here at the Ontario province, in Ontario, you can see that during this time, there is a sharp decline in the provincial grants, which, I mean, makes sense. The province has less money, and if the province were to give about the same attention to uh, the, the amount going to education, it will go down. But if you look at the NDP government in BC during this time, it doesn't actually decline very much. There's a slight decline, but it, it, it never goes below what we have in 88, 89. And we can find that in, in uh, Quebec, we also see a decline, but not of the same sharpness. So you can say Quebec reflects a very pragmatic, the money a little bit. BC reflects a very strong emphasis in the NDP government. Uh, on education at this time. And what the uh, Ontario reflects is this very, very strong neo neoliberal uh, ideology driving the Harris government that uh, leads, I mean, leads to sharp decline of the, trying to reduce the public sector. And this is an ideal time to reduce the public sector. But, but the other thing we can see, for example, in, when, when in, in, in BC, when we in 2001 get a more neoliberal oriented government is that to begin with we can see there is a slight it stays stable but then the funding increases quite rapidly in BC I mean in, in constant dollar to post-secondary education uh, so, so it is but we can see part of it has this kind of ideological. But what we really can see, if you go to the mm -hmm. next one here, mm -hmm. I think, yeah. Then we can see that what happens in another part is, of course, where the, it really comes out very sharply, the differences, uh, and actually speaks against the accessibility in some places, is the average undergraduate fee and the deregulation of the fees. Uh, now we have. Yeah, here if you look at Ontario, you can see the very, very sharp rise during the, 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 the Harris government, uh, and then slightly continuing. In BC, when the Liberal governments come in in 2001-2, we can see the deregulation and very, very sharp increase in the fee structure, which means that increased accessibility is coming on the notion where the family will pay, not the state, and uh, the, the, it is to create kind of a market forces to let that play, play itself out. 
in, in, in this notion. The other thing that we might say, uh, I mean, quite briefly, if you look at, I said that BC, where we have shown how BC has a general, had a generally increased over time, uh, what is this different in the BC strategy with the other provinces is that the BC strategy lends itself or was aimed to increase it very quickly, the participation rates. But it gave very little attention to quality in the sense that the funding per student decreased more in BC than it did in the other parts. So we can see less funding. The other thing that we might want to discuss later is that are these good, I mean this is only one indication of kind of accessibility policy where we have seen funding. We would have to look, and I know Amy having had an article one time when she looked at where the new places have come. So in BC we get new places coming in the new universities. And we, if we really wanted to see accessibility, we have to talk accessibility to different parts of the system. But if I go on with this time, we never get through this. Uh, so moving on to marketization. Yeah, I mean, this is the other side. The funding is the other side of, of, of course, uh, the, the student funding speaks to marketization too. And we can look at that. What, what One important part of marketization is, of course, deregulation and f moving the funding from the state and, and on to the, uh, what they would call the consumer. I mean, in this field, the student and the families. So if you look at this table here, we have looked at the uh, total government spending and tuition as percentage of university operating revenue. And if you take, for example, take, take Ontario, we can see that in 1994, government funding made up 73% of the uh, total, the, 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 the revenue for the university. So we see a strong kind of public uh, responsibility. In 2008, it had dropped under 50% down to 49% uh, of, of the funding, which means that much more now relies on the students. And on the other side, of course, the student part of the funding has gone up from 23 to 42%. Uh, BC also have, has, has a strong shift, but not so strong. And the government funding in, uh, in Quebec shows that the government it has, was reduced during this time, but it still, was still here quite high, uh, over 70%. Uh, if we were discussing this with economists, they would have said 49%, that's perfect. If you look at you know, the, what, the, 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 the social and the uh, individual return or rate of education, rate, rates to investment in education. I mean, that's a big argument from an economist, but uh, th this is what it looks like here. The other part where we can see the marketization is, is in the trying to create competition. So we can see the, 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 the changes in legislation in BC and Ontario, the Larwick private uh, university and for, uh, for profit universities. This is the notion that the uh, government will create competition that would lead to more variety and lead to, to, to a higher participation rate. Uh, we, we don't discuss that very much here, but for those of you who have looked at what really happens in BC with the private universities, uh, we know that the success story is not there so much. But, so what we can find here is that the rhetoric on privatization is much louder than actually the impact if we look at where, where students are and where they've gone. That, that's, uh, the other thing with marketization is, of course, the, the international students that increases very, very quickly, uh, trying to get, get new markets there. Accountability. Uh, I won't say so much about accountability, but we can see that there, there's a lot of uh, talk and, and, and a, a lot of uh, uh, stress in the policy documents on accountability. On the broader sense, we can say that this is a text, if one looks at it, that speaks very much to the general public. 
that we are uh, accountable, our money are well spent, and our money goes to things that will benefit the, the, the province to a large extent. This is particularly true of BC, where the, we, we have a rather soft intervention from the, the provincial government into the accountability mechanism of the universities and, and of the PSE system, particularly the universities. In one report, but there are very few uh, kind of repercussions from what is being reported. Uh, Ontario, particularly during the Harris government, I think, had much, had, had partly stricter uh, system of accountability, and those kind of are, are a little bit softened up during the, the liberal era. But what stands out most for us here on accountability is the difference between the strong rhetoric and in an international comparative perspective, rather soft uh, uh, kind of follow-up mechanisms. I mean, they're there, but so, to, to a large extent, if you look what has happened, it's also things, I mean, Don said we are not for core, we are for structuralist, but there is a form of governmentality that the institution has to a large extent introduced a mechanism themselves <coughs> in order to feel that they are more responsible to the, the surrounding society and being able to, to, to make arguments. Uh, so I think we would really... We'll move on for labor force development, <clears throat> the fourth uh, yeah. thing. I mean, th this has been the part which has been seen as <coughs> part of together with, with accountability, particularly we have in, in Ontario, partly in BC. Uh, it's a lot, the, the, the stress is that the system has to be more responsible to the economy. Uh, and what is particularly in BC, we have it during the the, 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 the NDP government with the skills now, uh, and it's a very, very strong, and we get some specially earmarked programs. But what, if you look at each of the provinces, that the, although there is an increase in so-called vocational program, there is the whole time, in relative terms, a decrease in vocational programs, which means that the academic side increases much faster than the vocational side. Uh, has, has ever happened in the same. And that also speaks to the things that there are very, the mechanisms to be used are not, I mean, are not put into place if one really wanted to do that. If one really wanted to push the system, uh, one, one could change the funding and so on. We can see a renewed, I mean, now emphasis on uh, the vocationalization in BC with the, L, L, with the, 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 the gas. LNG and so on, and, and the re, kind of the counter reaction from the universities. In uh, what it takes place is that there is some kind of a co uh, finance program, that's something that particularly Ontario made a lot of use of. But again, we find this distinction between the rhetoric. The other thing we can see is also responsibility within. The, the, the universities. We see a shift, for example, of developing more advanced programs that could be seen as being vocational within the university structures. Let's move on to the final. This is the fifth theme uh, we talked about, research and development, and the graph here helps illustrate this. Uh, the differences between the provinces are very clear. First of all, the, the, the middle uh, line is Canada as a whole. Uh, the bottom line is BC, and then we have Ontario and Quebec, and this is stirred as a proportion uh, of uh, GDP. Probably the best way we can um, we can estimate and, and uh, document uh, research and development. You can see that both Ontario and Quebec have had a very strong commitment to uh, research and development. Uh, it's fair to say that, uh, and indeed the policies that they've developed in terms of science and technology within the PSE sector very much correspond to and align with the innovation agenda at the federal level. We can see lots and lots of overlap in terms of the policy formation. It's fair to say that Quebec, in, uh, really from, from the early 80s, decided that they would create a parallel system to the federal system. Uh, they have parallel councils to the three major granting councils and uh, uh, on, on occasion uh, have spent more uh, internally 
uh, than, than <coughs> the federal government in various areas. So a very strong commitment uh, in these two provinces to research and development and the underlying notion that the production of new knowledge will indeed lead to economic development or contribute, I should say, to economic development and that's a value not uh, just uh, individually, of course, to the institution, but it's a, a, a value to the province and the nation at large. So we're moving now into the final section, the conclusion, and the first part of it, we want to talk uh, about the uh, restructuring of the state. <coughs> as, we, we, as we interpreted our evidence and, our, and, and the, 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 the work we've just talked about, uh, we, of course, are documenting a, a, a growing role, in our view, of the PSC systems in, uh, in the legitimation and accumulation functions served by the state. What we uh, posited towards the end of, of the study, in the conclusion, is, uh, is a, a diagram I'm going to show you in a moment where there are three axes, the provincial, federal, uh, <coughs> legitimation, accumulation, and accessibility and accountability. Excuse my uh, uh, drafting skill. <laughs> I can assure you this is not in the book. Uh, so, so, but, but, I, but, but I wanted you to, to, to get a sense of, of what we are talking about. We are talking about this really rather complicated relations. And I, I'm going to read a couple of paragraphs that focus on the, the four boxes that connect legitimation, accumulation, and accessibility and accountability. So the four sets of provincial relations in our model are as follows. One, accessibility legitimation, and you can locate the boxes as I go through. Two, accessibility accumulation. Three, accountability legitimation. And four, accountability accumulation. In the first relational set, that is, accessibility legitimation, administrations across the political spectrum, NDP, Liberal, Parti Québécois, etc., in all three provinces have consistently used PSE policies on accessibility to legitimate their governments. This has occurred in a number of ways, such as the increase in funding to, to, uh, to move the participation rates into the universal category. And for the, those of you not familiar with the literature, that's a 40% plus uh, participation rate for 18 to 24 year olds. Uh, and that, that all three provinces have moved into that category uh, over this period. The extension of degree granting status to more institutions, nowhere more obvious than in British Columbia, uh, and now in Ontario, uh, and of course in Alberta as well. Thereby changing the structure of the PSE systems in both Ontario and British Columbia, and changes in tuition uh, uh, fee regulation associated with the election of neoliberal regimes. Uh, the Harris government in the 90s, the, uh, uh, the uh, uh, liberal government here in, in 2001 in British Columbia. In the second relational set, this is accessibility accumulation. Again, accessibility fulfills an accumulation function at the individual level as the opportunity to obtain credentials both academic and vocational, is extended to a larger share of the population. We argue that PSC state policy on accessibility at the provincial level has primarily been aimed at achieving greater economic security for individuals. The connection between educational opportunity, the accumulation of what Bourdieu would call cultural capital, and getting a job has become part of our taken for granted assumptions about modern society. <clears throat> we argue in these ways that all three provincial governments have made PSC more central to the way they fulfill the legitimation and accumulation functions. Let me move to the third relation, that is accountability legitimation. In this, in this set, we have documented the different ways that administrations have used PSC policy to make the systems more accountable to the state and in turn accountable to the population at large. Quebec, more than any uh, other province, or the other provinces in the study, I should say, has uh, practiced a strict internal accountability regime, followed by Ontario. British Columbia has been the least inclined to adopt measures that apply to all institutions in the system. 
We argue that all three provinces have used PSE policy as a means toward attaining general accountability to the electorate and thereby have contributed to its legitimation function. Finally, the fourth set, accountability accumulation. This is most prominent in Ontario and Quebec, which have adopted clear science and technology policies, I'm repeating what I said a moment ago, that align with the federal initiatives around innovation and, and that have led to significant investment in R&D at the provincial level. Successive governments in both provinces have thereby made themselves accountable in a collected sense for linking the production of new knowledge to economic development. In so doing, these PSE policies have contributed to the accumulation function at the collective level, both provincially and by extension nationally. So let's move on to the next conclusion. You can ask then, Hattie, what all this means, so we have to read it. Now. <laughs> well, it's, you can, yeah, it, <laughs> it took us a long time to compose those paragraphs, and we didn't want to get anything wrong. <laughs> uh, so let me move to the next conclusion. This, is, this will not be so profound. Um, the, uh, the, the, the globalization, I mean, in some ways, as we said, that, that the three provinces in, in the study can we can think we think about it a little bit at the end, we put it into the globalization debate that is to very much the discussion between convergence and divergence on policy. I mean some of the globalization theorists and, and the things hold of course that the neoliberal uh, world domination would lead to very, very strong uh, convergence of policies. And at the same time, you can find, particularly in labor market uh, researchers, also some arguing that we can see a very strong divergence just now, uh, even under the neoliberal regimes. Uh, but uh, if we look at these things and see what, what does the study really say, or what, I mean, or how we interpret what it says. Uh, one hand, we can see that there are many forms of, of Converge, uh, converges, particularly in, in the language, in different policies. And we also have, I mean, everyone brings in something on, talks about accessibility, accountability. There are deregulations, there are market mechanisms. There, there are, I mean, clear certain neoliberal uh, 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 convergences. But we can also see, I mean, what stands out is particularly the is particularly Quebec that even during a, a, a government like, like the, uh, the, when the liberals were in power, with a very strong language of neoliberal, and despite, uh, you know, one has to be careful in the sense that certain pol money can be changed, policies can, can drift, but how far have they drifted? I mean, that's the whole thing when one looks at the, for example, I mean, in some of the European social democratic countries, how far has it gone? But if we look at that, what stands out is really more convergence than divergence. If you look at Quebec and the others, or, or, or the exceptionalism of, 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 of Quebec. And that, as we talked before, can, can partly be understood by nationalists and by very, very strong public sector unions. And, and the, the, this can, and, and the, the, the other part here is, of course, we can also see that, that uh, during the uh, NDP government that we described here, that we could see that the money increased uh, during, <coughs> during a time of, of, of declining federal funding. There's also a form of exceptionalism that there are certain that, and this is also under a strong term of neoliberalism, that there is a, it, it converges away from, uh, no, sorry, it, 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 it separates itself out. And, and these things actually speaks to, to one form here that, that they, they give some evidence against the inevitability of globalization. Uh, what it shows partly, and there's something like people like McBride and others who are, are writing on globalization are arguing in Canada that globalization is sometimes constructed by government as a way that we have no options. 
I mean, it's, 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 it's an active act by government to say that, or particularly we can find it in the business, in, from, from where we hear from the central business leaders that the economy is going this, we have no option but to do certain things. And what little bit we can see, at least hinted to in, in this comparison, and we can find it more strongly in other international, is that to a certain extent, there is under this globalization a, a kind of a possibilities to act partly in a different way. And what we can see then, I mean, particularly in Quebec, in that this is particularly dr driven when we have a kind of an institution like a, a strong labor movement that can act against uh, capital in some ways, and then the state reacting in between. And at least we can, it hints to that that one has to have a, a certain, uh, maybe more sensitivity than what we had about, what we began about the notion about how the neoliberal will, 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 will enter in directly. That doesn't mean that, that I mean, the, the whole kind of thing sets certain, certain limits. The other thing that's also linked a little bit to, 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 to end up here is what we have become very kind of aware of, or, or maybe, is the complex interplay, interplay between political, economic, and social forces. And in that way, I mean, partly that there are contradictions the whole time, much more so than we thought about it. That, for example, how is it that even when we ascribe to the very strong kind of neoliberal ideology of the present liberal government we have had here, we can see a strong increase in, in, in funding. Uh, and that might, I mean, that can be explained, but this is good politics. This is good politics in order to be, to, 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 to legitimate what we're doing to be re-elected. Re but there are the hope, we also have during the NDP government uh, here, we have an introduction of two new, I mean, publicly funded institutions that, but were still very closely linked to the kind of the private sector when we had these special universities. It's also a contradiction a little bit to the ideology we talked about, but it can, can be explained. Um, and the other thing that, that stands out to us and in, in linked to this is the the stronger impact than we kind of had, I mean, thought about when we started, about the kind of the financial situation and the fiscal situation, I should say. That it, it's almost like when it's kind of difficult fiscal times, it's, uh, they, they, then in some ways, some of the ideologies come out very clearly. I mean, then one chooses a certain way of acting to solving it, and then the marketization, the, the, this way it comes out strongly. When the times are better, uh, it gets more, uh, how can we say, a little bit hidden. In, in the, that's one thing. But the other thing that also one can also reflect on, we can talk, is about what kind of, you call it for a better over here, I mean, foreigner talk about Canada, the, 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 the Canadian state, the Canadian society. We, we have the deregulations of fees, but then we have the counter uh, action to that, the deregulation that, that happens in, 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 I mean, both in BC and in, in, in Ontario. Uh, should one see that, that the system, the Canadian, I was going to, the Canadian population or the Canadian society will not tolerate a neoliberal going too extreme? I mean, that's one of the interpretations we have had. It's almost like there is a kind of a, a set of a scope for how far this can go in Canada. I mean, they would never go like it did in New Zealand very quickly, and then, or in, in England, in Australia, in, in some of these ways. So that, that's the other thing that we have, have come quite aware of. So I think we stop here. We should, but before we stop, I should recognize the fact that Rob, Rob Cliff, who's here, and J.C. Lee, are responsible for all of the the graphs yeah. in in the uh, in, in the study. Thanks for coming.